Good morning, church family. So good to see you. Would you stand as I read God's word? I'm going to be reading Psalm 150, 1 through 6. Psalm 150, 1 through 6. Y'all probably recognize this as being one of my favorites. So praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the lute and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise Him this morning. Y'all sing out. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangel in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In His arms He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, 
ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals loud with Hosanna ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Amen, amen. What a wonderful way to start a service, singing praise Him, praise Him. And indeed, we need to praise Him and just thank Him that you woke up this morning. Another new day, another new day. Brother, I saw you holding the baby, the precious baby. Congratulations, by the way. And I, I was thinking, as we were singing that, thinking about Jesus holding us as children and loving us and always. So, so good to see you. If you're a guest, we especially want to say a word of welcome. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us this morning. You have a bulletin. You should have got one in the back. Have an opportunity. There's a spot in the back that you can fill out a little information. We'd love to hear from you and about you a little bit. There's also a spot for prayer requests and prayer needs. Please fill that out, church family as well, so we'll know how to better pray for y'all. So once again, it's just so, so very good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. A little cooler weather. We can all be thankful in Texas that we got a little cooler weather after the long, hard, hot summer. So God is good and God is gracious. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do indeed praise you this morning. We worship you. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Father, we don't deserve the goodness that you give, but yet you grant it, and we're thankful for it, Lord. I thank you for these who, Father, have come out to, to worship with us this morning, and Lord, pray you'd bless them, uh, Lord, in a special way. Father, we just ask this morning, Lord, that you would uh, clear our minds of all things so that that we can focus on you, that we can focus on your word, we can focus on worshiping you. Father, I pray that we would all come before you humbly this morning as we, as we pray and as we worship, Father, and realize that, Lord, you are God Almighty. You hear our cries, you hear our prayers. Father, may we fall before you humbly as we pray. And Lord, just pray you bless this service and this time together. We ask all of this in your holy, wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Continue. I know I had y'all stand the whole time, so we're going to sing, He Lives. He Lives. <clears throat> I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see His loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that He is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of His appearing will come at last. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to Him part. You ask me how I know He lives. And we can rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. 
The hope of all who see him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Amen. You can be seated. morning for scripture and prayer. We're going to be reading uh, Luke chapter 4. So if you want to grab your Bibles, uh, if you don't have one, there should be in the pew, one in the pew in front of you. Go ahead and grab that and turn with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And this morning we're going to read verses 16 through 21. Luke 4, 16 through 21. The word of the Lord says, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Pray with me, church family. Lord God, we stand humbly beneath your word. Lord, it is your word. Your perfect, infallible word. Revealing who you are to us. And Lord, as we read this passage, as Jesus is beginning his ministry proclaiming who He is as the Messiah and Lord. We thank You that Lord Jesus had the heart of a missionary. That Jesus had the heart of an evangelist. That from heaven on high, Lord, He looked upon us with pity and compassion and saw us in our lostness. And being obedient, Lord, He came to proclaim the good news to us who are poor in spirit. So Lord, I, I pray this morning... As we look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, Lord, we would have that same heart. That we would take up that same mission to proclaim good news to the poor, liberty to the captives. And Lord, we would show people the joy of following Jesus. Lord, this is our mission. This is our joy. This is our delight. Give us the strength to follow you, Lord. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand, church family? And sing the solid rock, the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. 
You know, church, uh, God just laid this on my heart, and I just want to share, and, and, and we'll do this sometimes, and I did it last week in a, in a song. I, I, I want you to understand as, as your worship pastor that when we sing these songs, there's deep, deep theology in each one of these songs that we sing. When you're singing and you're worshiping, Lord, you're singing truth. And, and, and it's important that we understand that when, when it's written and says, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. That's exactly what it is, and he's exactly who it is that we can lean on. The next song we're going to sing, In Christ Alone. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone. This solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love and what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. We can stand on Christ and we can stand on Christ alone, no matter what's going on in this, this crazy world, this pandemic, all this stuff. Look, our strength can be found in Christ alone. So as you sing this, as we worship together, as we're singing these songs of theology and truth, I pray that that would, that would just be in your heart and so we can sing out. And I've said it before, doesn't matter who's sitting beside you, standing beside you singing, doesn't matter if you can carry a tune in a bucket, it doesn't matter at all because you're not singing for the person that's standing next to you. You're singing to Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth. He longs to hear us sing, and that's what we're going to do right now in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone. This solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross has Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. Amen. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Sing it out. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ Life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns. Or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Amen.
Father, I'm so thankful and grateful that you came, that you lived the life you lived, that you died on that cross of Calvary and rose again on the third day so that those of us who believe that can have eternal life with you. And Father, you're so good and so gracious. And we praise you and thank you. And Father, as we come to this time at the service, Lord, where my brother's going to come bring the word, I pray that we would hear your word proclaimed, Father, and that would move our, our hearts, that we would be touched, that we would leave here differently because we have heard a word from you. And we ask this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, indeed. Church, you can be seated. It is good to see you on this Lord's Day, and I invite you to go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 5. Again, if you don't have one, there should be one in the pew in front of you. We want you to take that as our gift to you to have a copy of God's Word. So turn with me to Acts chapter 5. We're going to continue our study in the book of Acts today as we look at verses 12 through 42 in the book of Acts. Uh, the other night... We were going through our normal bedtime routine with the girls, and uh, after we read the Bible story and pray and sing and do our whole routine, one of the last things that I do before I put the girls to bed is I, I just tell them a story from the Bible. Uh, Karis every night wants me to tell her a story from the Bible that she doesn't know, which is awesome, uh, but you're, there's only so many kid-friendly stories in the Bible you can tell your child right before they go to bed. So uh, I was getting ready to tell her a story, and I decided to tell then the story of Daniel, walked the whole book of Daniel. And uh, I got to the point of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing in the furnace. Now we all know that story. I love that story. And we love how that story ends. You have these three men who defied a king, obeyed God, were thrown to a fiery furnace, and God was with them, uh, and he rescued them. And we love how that story ends, how God rescued them from this disaster. But as I was reading and telling them that story again, it occurred to me, one of my favorite parts of that story is not that they were rescued, but it's what God did in their hearts before they were rescued. Look with me what happens. Let me just read it back to you. As King Nebuchadnezzar is threatening them to bow down before a golden image and worship him, this is what they say. They look at this king, the most powerful man in the world at this time. They said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. That's an amazing story. The courage and boldness of these three men to look into the eyes of this king and say, we will not bow down to you, we will obey God more than you. And what we see in this, and what I love about this part, is that we see God giving these men the faith they need to obey Him rather than this King. God gives them the grace they need to proclaim God even if their life depends on it. We see what true obedience looks like. It's not merely standing up to a tyrannical ruler, but seizing every opportunity we have to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And we see the same thing happening in our passage today. Even when faced with persecution and harm, the early church chooses to obey God and evangelize the lost no matter the consequences. And that's what I want us to see in the passage today. I want us to see the importance of obedience in evangelism. You see, as followers of Christ, the church, we must be obedient to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ at all times at, to all people no matter the consequence. We are called to evangelize. That, that word means to share the gospel, to preach, to proclaim the good news. And what I want us to see is it's never treated as a suggestion in the Bible. God never looks upon His people and says, hey, if you're feeling like it, share the gospel. Jesus doesn't look at His disciples and say, if you're in the mood or everything's working out for you, then tell people about how they can spend an eternity in heaven. It's never a suggestion. Consider the last few words Jesus said before He ascended to heaven. The last words he said on this earth, he said in Matthew 28, 19, a verse we read every week, it says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Oh, flash forward, Acts 1, 8, right before he ascends to heaven, he looks at his followers and he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. 
These are not suggestions for us. These are our marching orders, beloved. Given with the expectation that we will obey them. But Jesus doesn't just say, do it because I said so. In fact, Jesus gives us reasons and motivations to follow Him and obey Him in this command. Romans 1.16, Paul says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Romans 10.14, he says, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed, and how are they to believe in whom they have not heard, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? So right here, Jesus is giving us a command and a reason to obey Him in that command. The command is, go and share the good news about Jesus Christ. And the reason is because people will not be saved and go to heaven without hearing it, without someone preaching it. This is what I want us to see in our passage, church, is that evangelism is an obedience issue. The Lord never gives us reasons to excuse it. We can't blame it on our personality. I'm just shy. I don't like talking to people. We can't blame it on our circumstances. Well, it would have been hard to do that. We can't blame it on our fear. It was just a scary situation. Evangelism, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, is a duty and delight for the church. And if you think about it, it's the primary reason that we are still here today. If we are Christians, believers, then why are we still here? Is it for worship? No. We could do that in heaven a lot better than we do it here, right? Is it for discipleship? No, we could do that better in heaven. We are here because the one thing we can't do in heaven is tell sinners about Jesus Christ. And so we are here for the purpose of proclaiming good news to those who need Jesus. So what I want us to look at in our passage today is four ways we must be obedient to share the gospel. Now before we get into our passage, I want us to look at uh, what precipitated this. This book of Acts is a narrative, it's a story, it's building upon itself. And so I want to see what happened right before this. Last week in our passage, we looked at how the church was functioning, right? There was a good side, there was a bad side. Many in the church in Acts 4, we see, were graciously and sacrificially giving. Uh, They were serving out of the, the love of Christ in their heart. We see Barnabas was one of these. He went and sold everything he had, his land. He brought it, he laid it at the apostles' feet, and he says, do what God wills. We had this attitude of self-sacrifice in the church. But then on the flip side, we had those who were just playing the part. Ananias and Sapphira. They came and they didn't really buy into the church. They had their toe in the water, but they did not commit to Jesus. They were hypocrites and liars. And to preserve the integrity and mission of the church, the Lord strikes them both dead where they are. Now that's where our story ends and our story today picks up. But before we look at that, look at verse 11. And I want to see how does the church respond to the Lord disciplining those in the church. How does the church respond to this justice? And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. This is what's amazing. God does something very startling. Like He he rains down His justice on the church, on those who are playing the part of church. And what is the response of the believers? Is it to run away in fear? Is it to find another church? Hey, I, I don't want to go to a church that, that kills people for not tithing, right? Their response was greater reverence for God. Greater reverence for His church and greater reverence for His commands. What we see happening right here is that the church and its leaders, what do they do? Once they see how God views the church, they go out and evangelize the lost. Church discipline did not hinder their mission, it empowered their mission. Witnessing God's standard of holiness actually motivated the church to greater acts of evangelism. And so what did this evangelistic obedience look like? Well, let's look at verses 12 through 16. And the first point I want us to see is that we must be obedient to serve for the gospel. We, as believers, must be obedient to serve for the gospel. Look with me at verses 12 through 16. So again, great fear came upon the whole church. Verse 12, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on the cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some 
of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were healed. Point number one, we must be obedient to serve for the gospel. So I want, I want to take a step back and look. As we're walking through the book of Acts, there is a pattern going on. Starting back in verse or chapter 1, there's a pattern of worship that leads to evangelism that leads to greater worship. You can read Acts and see it goes back and forth, back and forth. The church gathers together to pray, to hear the preaching of the word, to worship, and then immediately after they go to share the gospel with people in their community in Jerusalem. So back and forth, there's worship that leads to evangelism and evangelism that leads to worship. The apostles here, we see they're going out. They just had their worship. They're, they're living in the church. And now, what are they doing? They're going back and doing the very thing that got them arrested two chapters ago. They're going and serving people. And where do they go? It says Solomon's portico, Solomon's porch. This was a long colonnade standing uh, in the temple. So you have the temple center and then there's this colonnade, uh, almost like a hallway, where Peter and John and the apostles would go and they would hang out with people. They would talk to them about Scripture. They would heal the sick. And what we see happening in this first section is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, is working through the apostles, healing people to show that Jesus is Messiah and Lord. And as they're doing this, we witness almost this visible, tangible tension happening in the hearts of the people. Look at verse 13. It says, None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. So there's this tension in the hearts of the people. They, they don't want to join the church because this is dangerous. Remember that they are uh, living, the church is living in opposition to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the people that just killed Jesus can easily kill the church. And so there is this tension in their hearts. They're, they're nervous because if they join the church, they're laying their lives on the line. But they can't deny something's happening here. The apostles are healing The church is loving people. There's something special about these these followers of Christ. And as we see uh, in verse 14, the love of Christ actually wins out. Verse 14 says, But many multitudes, both men and women, were being added to their number. So as people are seeing the church love and serve people, they're seeing the love of Christ, they're being saved through that. Multitudes are coming to faith. And the word's getting out. People from the streets are now coming to the apostles. People from outside of Jerusalem, Acts 1-8 is being fulfilled here. They're spreading outside of the city. People from outside in the community are coming in to hear the gospel. So here's the question. Why was the gospel spreading like this? Why was the gospel spreading? What we see in the book of Acts and in our passage today, it was because the early church, the early church had a go and serve mentality, not a come and get mentality. If you read through Acts, this is the the standard by which the church lives. They're not really serving within the body. They're going outside the body of Christ and serving the poor, the needy, the destitute, the afflicted, the downcast. Nowhere do we see in the book of Acts, or I'd say even the New Testament, do we see unbelievers coming knocking on the door of the church saying, let us in, let us in. What we see is believers running and knocking on the doors of unbelievers saying, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me serve you. This is what's happening in the Bible. People are going out. They're doing life. Believers are meeting the needs of unbelievers and serving them. Why? For the sake of the gospel. And sadly, I believe in 2,000 years, we as a church have reversed this mentality. We have sacrificed the biblical model for church for a practical model for church. Instead of going and serving, we tend to want people to come and get We would rather unbelievers get out of their comfort zones to be here instead of us believers getting out of our comfort zones and serving them where they are. Let me put it this way. Let's say today you go home. And for some reason, don't think about it, for some reason you find a cure for COVID. Okay, I don't know how it happens, but you go home and and you have a cure for this virus that is just wrecking our world. People are dying or sick. The economy is terrible. And you have this cure. You just find it and you can heal the world. Now, what do you do with that? You have two options. One, you can go get a sign and put it out in your yard and say, cure for COVID, come on in. 
Okay, that's one option. Uh, kind of sounds a little crazy, but you could just put a sign and say, hey, come inside, I'll give you a cure to COVID. Or if you have a cure for a virus that is destroying our world, you could go out and start telling people how they can be saved from it. You can go and say, hey, here's a cure that will save you today. Here's a cure that will turn our world and change the way we're living. Or fill in the blank, it could be COVID or cancer, AIDS, whatever it is. If you find a cure for it, you're not going to put a sign in your yard and say, come and get it. You're going to go and give it to people because you know it saves lives. Christians, brothers and sisters, we have a cure greater than anything else in the world. There is a disease that is leading people to hell called sin. And we have the cure, Jesus Christ, in our hearts and in our hands. Yet too often we put signs up and say, come and get, rather than going and serving and giving it to people who need it, who are spiritually blind and dying. They don't think they need anything. And we have this cure in our hands. And what do we see the Lord doing with the church that goes and serves? He blesses them. People grow. The church grows. The kingdom grows. Because the church and believers are going and serving We must be obedient to go out and serve for the gospel. That is what God has called us to do. To go to the colonnade. To go to where unbelievers gather. To go and meet people where they are and share with them the truth of Jesus Christ. We must be obedient to serve for the gospel. Number two, we must be obedient to speak the gospel. We must be obedient to speak the gospel. Follow with me in verses 17 through 21. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. We'll stop right there. We must be obedient to speak the gospel. So predictably, what we've seen so far in Acts is serving people in the name of Jesus will get you into trouble. Peter and John have already stood before the Sanhedrin and threatened with their life. But now we see that they're evangelizing again. They're sharing. They're not stopping. They say, we will not stop talking about Jesus. And it lands them in the same position. They're arrested. By who? The Sadducees. Now, we don't know a lot about the Sadducees. We know a lot about the Pharisees. The Pharisees of the Jewish people, they're the the conservative people, the conservative sect of Judaism. But the Sadducees... This older and longer serving sect, they were more the liberal side of things. They looked at the Old Testament and they only believed in the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the Pentateuch. Anything outside of that, they said, oh, that's, not, that's not biblical. So that means that they had some pretty crazy beliefs. They did not believe in angels. They did not believe in supernatural gifts. They did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in eternal life. They did not believe in heaven or hell. But you know what they did believe in? They believed in power. The Sadducees loved their power over people. These were a politically corrupt leaders who submitted to Rome more than God. Because Rome gave them this power they had over the Jewish people. And the people submitted to them because they looked at them as their leaders. And that was until this guy named Jesus came around and started preaching a gospel not of works but of grace. He didn't say he had to become Jewish to be part of God's family. You need to follow me to become part of God's family. And and now the disciples were and the apostles were taking this up. And people were following. And the kingdom of God was growing. The Sadducees saw their power fleeing. And so what do they do? It says they were jealous. They wanted that power. They wanted authority over people. And so how did they deal with this? They saw the apostles and say, let's arrest them. Let's put them in prison. Now I just want us to step back and see how much this verse here is laced with irony. So think about it. The apostles are in the public square healing people and sharing the gospel. And the Sadducees arrest them and look where they put them. They put them in a private prison and they put them in a public prison. They put them and chained them to criminals and destitutes. The very people they came to share the gospel with. Look at some more irony. That night um, in, in jail, the Sadducees denied the existence of angels. Who freed the apostles from prison? The angel. Angel of the Lord. Doesn't God have a sense of humor here? I love He just putting this in the Sadducees' face. You made a bad decision. You put them in a prison full of of people who need Jesus. You chain them to them. And then an angel comes and sets them free. Something you did not even existed. Now why does the angel set them free? What's the point of it? Is it for their safety? Is it for their freedom? And so they can go back to their house and be comfortable? Church, look with me at verse 20. 
And look what the words of the angel. He looks to the apostles and says, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, what did they do, church? They entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. The angel freed them and gave them a command, marching orders. Go back to where you just were. Go back to where you were just arrested and keep on doing what you're doing. Speak the gospel. God intervened in the persecution of His people, not for the sake of their safety, church, but for the sake of evangelism. What does this tell us about God's priorities for our life? God is more concerned with our obedience than our comfort. I believe one of the greatest hindrances to our speaking the gospel to others is our desire for comfort and safety over obedience, over faithfulness. We so often have a greater desire to avoid awkward situations more than telling someone how they can be saved. And listen, I'm not going to tell you this. I struggle with this too. Brother Pat and I were sitting in my office this morning confessing our sins of opportunities we missed this past week to share the gospel. I pulled up to a red light the other day. There was a man holding up a sign. He needed money for weed and beer. And I looked at him and I just kind of like avoided him. And as I was doing that, I felt the Lord saying, foolish man. There is a man crying out for hope. And here I am wanting to avoid an awkward situation when I can just say what I, uh, Peter and John said in Acts 3. Hey, I can't give you silver or gold, but what I can give you, I can give you Jesus Christ. When we look at people in this world, we can say, hey, they need Jesus. And we can say, hey, Jesus loves you. Let me pray with you. Even if it's for five seconds at a red light. Every day, God puts people in our path. Yet so often, we choose comfort over faithfulness. May the Lord forgive us for that. For prioritizing our, our comfort over His glory. Beloved, the Lord has freed us. He has freed us from a prison of our own sin and death. He called us to go and speak the words of life. He's given us freedom. He's given us His words. He's given us a place to go. And He's put lost people in our path. May we, like the apostles, be obedient to go and share the good news. We have no excuse. We must be obedient to speak the gospel. Point number three. We must be obedient to stand for the gospel. We must be obedient to stand. It's to stand for the gospel. Follow with me in verse 21. Verse 21, he says this. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in prison, so they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than the men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. So let's look at this story so far. The next morning, the apostles are freed. They're free. They go and speak and preach the good news. As the Sanhedrin comes back to determine the fate of these men they put in prison... They've warned them to stop preaching the gospel. They say if you're going to do it again, the consequence will be more severe. And as they prepare to bring the apostles in, again, church, we see God's humor. <laughs> look what he says. They, they, they say, go get the apostles. And here comes the man and says, hey, look, they're not here. The guards are there. The gate's shut. But we don't know where they are. And what's the response? They're confused. 
They're perplexed. They're dumbfounded. They don't know what to do. These seemingly powerful and wise men are now shown to be powerless. And they bring them in finally and they say, go get them. We'll bring them in. And they notice, they, they ask politely. They say, hey, we, we don't want to do this. So they're asking the, the prisoners who escaped from prison, say, hey, can you, can you please come back? See, Peter and John and the apostles, they say, okay, we'll, we'll go and stand before your, your kangaroo court here. And the Sanhedrin reads out their accusation. Basically, he gives them three accusations. Let me summarize them. The first accusation is you dis- disobeyed us and you continue to preach in the temple. Number two, you filled this city with Jesus Christ and you're saving people. Number three, you have accused us of killing Jesus. So the charge is stated. The sentence could be death. How does Peter respond? Was he silent? Did he water down his message? Did he try to avoid confrontation? No, Peter's response, church, shows us how we must stand up for the gospel, even if our life depends on it. When we speak the gospel, we must first confront sin. We must confront sin. Listen to what Peter said to the Sanhedrin. Seventy-one men in a semicircle standing above Peter. He looked at them and says, Whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. This is the second time Peter's done this. Peter's been through this before. He knows how this goes. And he's standing before these men as they read out the accusation. And Peter calls out their sin. See, why did Peter do this? Because he knows these men can, can, can condemn my body to death, but they can't condemn my soul. God has my soul. So whatever they do to me, they cannot take away my faith. And so he's bold to speak on behalf of God. He's obedient to God first and foremost. And what does he say? He says, you Sanhedrin, you counsel, you hung Jesus on a tree. You murdered the author of life, he says in Acts 3. You've cursed him as a blasphemer. Jesus died at the hands of these men. And Peter told them to their faces. Now why did he share this? Was it because he was being mean-hearted, mean-spirited? No, because Jesus or, or Peter loved them. He felt compassion for their souls. Because he knew the only way for them to truly believe in Jesus Christ is for first for them to see their sin. Church, when we evangelize, our goal is first, we confront sin. As one man once told me, sometimes we have to get people lost before we get them saved. Meaning, sometimes, and every time actually, people have to see their sin before they need see their need for a Savior. People need to see they're drowning in the deep end of the pool, and they need to reach out for a life raft. So how do we do this? How do we, in a Christ-like way, confront people with their sin? Well, first and foremost, we do not condemn, but we share it in love. We share it not because we're better than anybody else, but because we have been healed by Jesus Christ. We are former patients, not doctors, we're former patients, and now we're advocating for the healing that Jesus can give. And so when we've been healed of this disease of sin, we go to people imploring them, listen, you can be healed too. We do it in love because we want to see people in heaven. But church, to to overlook sin is unloving. It's to ignore the thing that is sending them to hell. Jesus died on the cross for sinners who are under God's wrath and judgment. And without a Savior, they will face a physical and eternal death. And we need to show them that in love. So Peter did not tiptoe around the issue. He looked at these men and he confronted their sin. He says, you, you, Sanhedrin, you, brothers and sisters in Christ, we, we have killed Christ. Number two, we confront sin. Number two, we exalt Jesus. We exalt Jesus. Peter looks at them and he says, God raised this Jesus whom you have killed. And they exalted him at his right hand. You see, listen, knowing your sin is not enough to be saved. I think if I said everybody in this room, raise your hand if you're a sinner, you would. We know we're sinners. We try to justify it, but we know that we are sinners. I think in the past and in the culture I grew up in, the church was really good at this part, right? Like we're really good at the, the making sure you know you're a sinner. From my past growing up in churches, going to those judgment houses, you know, you walk through there and you see all the bad things that can happen to you. You're going to reach out to anything that can get you out of that. Any person or anything, just give it to me. I want to get out of that. And we scare people out of hell. But listen, that's not enough. It's not enough for Peter to call out sin. It's not enough for us to recognize that we're a sinner. We need to see Jesus. And so what does Peter do? He exalts Jesus. He shows them that Jesus is the answer. Jesus is on the throne room. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, he says. And by doing so, he's showing that it's only through Jesus Christ that we are saved. You see, if we preach sin without a Savior, then people will look to every other thing to save Him. 
If we preach sin without a Savior, people will think, well, if I do good enough, then I can be saved. They'll look to their jobs, to pleasure, to money, anything that can fill that, that yearning to escape punishment. But none of these things can save us. They just condemn us even more. So when we share the gospel, we must share Jesus Christ. And what does Peter say he is? He is leader, or your version might say prince, or captain. That word basically is, is calling Jesus our Lord, our Master. We must preach that Jesus is King of kings. And that for us to follow Him, to be saved, we bend the knee to Christ. We submit our life and our will before Him. Number two, we must believe that He is Christ, Messiah. He is Savior. That Jesus actually did come. He did die on the cross for our sins. He took our punishment. He took God's wrath for us so that we may be saved. People will not be saved unless they see their sin and receive their Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And we must be clear on this. Jesus is not just some ticket to heaven. He's not some good God that sets an example for us to follow. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. So when we share the gospel, we keep Christ the center. Number three, we offer repentance. We offer repentance. Look what Peter does. This is amazing. In the midst of this, he doesn't just say, hey, you put Jesus on the cross. He exalts Christ. And in the middle of this, he says Jesus Christ came to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Peter's offering repentance to these men who are trying to kill him. What I want us to see this church is no one, no one, no one is outside the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you look through the history of the Bible, you see that God is passionate about reaching the worst of the worst. He sent Jonah to the Ninevites. Some of the worst people in the history of the world. Jonah, go and tell them to repent. God cared about the Ninevites. He sent Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to Babylon, the people that conquered them. He told them to love King Nebuchadnezzar. He sent Jesus to a man named Saul who was actively trying to kill the church and kill Christians. No one is too far gone to be offered repentance. And even these evil men who murdered Jesus, God gives the opportunity to turn away from their sins and trust in Christ. This is what makes the good news so good, church. It's not just that we are sinners. It's not that Jesus died on the cross. It's that we can have repentance. We have to offer people a way out of their sin. Jesus says, repent and believe. Repent. Turn away from the path of destruction. Leave that sin behind, hating it, and cling to the feet of Jesus Christ. Cling to Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's the good news. Lastly, number four, we are to trust God. We must trust God. This is what Peter did. He did not delay, belabor the point. He shared truth, and he trusted God with their hearts. We must understand, church, that we do not have the power to save a single soul on this earth. None of us is good enough. Our words aren't are nice enough. We do not have the power to save people. Only Jesus does. Our job and our call is to be faithful and obedient, to share the good news and trust Christ with their heart. How freeing is that? Shouldn't that free you up to share with people? That, hey, it's not my responsibility to convince them to, to trust in Jesus. God does that work through the Holy Spirit in their heart. My job is just to say, Jesus loves you. You're in sin. Turn and repent and find hope in Jesus Christ and eternal life in Him. That is freeing for us to do. We don't have to change the message. We don't have to make it easier. We don't have to water it down. God does the work. We're called to be obedient. And that means that God can even save people through our awkward and uncomfortable conversations about the gospel. And does that mean we're cold and uncaring with it? No, it means we implore people to be saved. We make passionate appeals for the lost to come to Christ. In fact, knowing God saves the heart actually impassions us more to tell people to turn from their sins. I love Charles Spurgeon quote. He says this, If sinners are going to hell, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. If they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled with the teeth of our exertions and let no one go unwarned and unprayed for. When we persuade men to come to Christ, we're trusting God alone to save them. And our job is to be as faithful and obedient to Him as possible. So if we're followers of Christ, then we will 
In every circumstance, we will stand up for our faith. We will speak about Jesus with passion and clarity. And lastly, we must be obedient to suffer for the gospel. Oh, how I wish I could leave this one out. Look with me at verse 34 through 42. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to the men of Israel, Take care what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed. And all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and praying that the Christ is Jesus. We must be obedient to suffer for the gospel. The apostles made a stand for Jesus. And what did it cost them? The Sanhedrin was confronted with their sin. They were blind to the Savior. And they were willing to lash out in rage and kill these men. But by God's grace, a man named Gamaliel, Pharisee, stood up. We know a little about Gamaliel. He he was the one who mentored and taught this guy named Saul to be a Pharisee. Saul would eventually become Paul. Gamaliel explained, this is an error to kill these men. They should instead take a wait-and-see approach. Other moments have risen up and failed, but if this movement proceeds from God, it's not going to fail. So we don't know his motivation here. He might just be sitting on the fence. He doesn't want to get in trouble. We don't know, but what we do know is that what he said convinced the Sanhedrin to not kill these men. So instead, they just whip them and beat them. This term is referring to that 39 lashes, the 40 minus 1, the same that Jesus received. These men were not just punched a few times. They were beaten badly. And they thought, surely this will do the trick. This would silence this movement. But church, look, did it work? We are standing here today because these men would not be silent. After they suffered for Jesus and they were told not to speak, did they they shut their mouths and go home? What did they do? It says they rejoiced in the name of Jesus. They filled the city of Jerusalem with rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. And then what did they do? They grew bolder. They started preaching the the gospel in the temple again. But now, they started going house to house, knocking on doors, telling, let us tell you about Jesus. We must be obedient to suffer for the gospel. You see, Satan was working hard in verses, in chapters 5 and 6, and we'll see even more. Satan's working hard to extinguish the church. He tried to divide the church through Ananias and Sapphira, but what happened? The church grew stronger. He tried to silence the apostles by by, by making them suffer, but the church grew louder. And the book of Acts is a testimony to the work of suffering in evangelism. Suffering does not stop the gospel church. It spreads it. I heard this the other night. Someone said, some flowers spread their seed when trampled on the ground. The church grows when it suffers. We see it in the Bible. We see it in China. We see it in Africa. We see it in the Middle East. When the church is suffering, the gospel is spreading. Suffering does not stop the gospel. Silence stops the gospel. What stops the gospel is pursuing comfort over faithfulness. What stops the gospel is pursuing an easy life rather than a faithful life. And so here is the question. If we look around the world and we look in history and say, hey, why? Why isn't the gospel growing? You see, we see it growing in China. We see it growing here. Why isn't it growing in America? Why isn't it growing in our backyard? Let us ask ourselves the hard question. Are we willing to suffer for the gospel? Are we willing to face harm and ridicule and gossip and death so that others might be saved? Do we love God enough to obey Him even if we lose everything? 
Beloved, we can serve, we can speak, we can stand, and we can suffer for the gospel. You know why? Because Jesus did. Jesus, the ultimate evangelist, left his place in heaven to come down in our mission field. He served, he shared, he suffered to take away our sins and to bring us new life. Jesus was a perfect example of obedience. And that obedience led him to the cross where he died to bring us eternal life. If we are in Christ, we too can be obedient to bring the gospel to a lost world. We can do, as we like to say, all things through Christ who strengthens us. May we be obedient to serve Speak, stand, and suffer for the gospel, for the glory of God, for the salvation of the lost. Pray with me, church. Father God, we, we stand before you humbled. I stand before you humbled. An unworthy servant. Well, Lord, I confess my sin just this week. Lord, I turned a blind eye to someone who needed Jesus. Woe is me, a man of unclean lips, Father, as Isaiah says. Father God, I pray that you, by the power of your Spirit, would put such a deep passion in our hearts, Lord, that we, like Jeremiah, cannot help but speak. It is a fire in our bones. And it cannot be contained. Lord, help us, as your people, as your church, to go and serve for the sake of the lost. Help us to be bold, Because we love Jesus and we fear God. And Lord, I pray that we would open our eyes to see outside these walls all the people that need Jesus, even in our community, even in our country. Thousands need Jesus. And we have the cure for their sin sick heart. Lord, work in our hearts. Give us the grace to be bold, to stand up and speak and suffer and serve for the gospel. For your glory and your glory alone. And Lord, I pray right now, if there's someone in this room and they're hearing the gospel, they've heard it a thousand times, but it's new to them right now and it's penetrating their hearts and they feel their sin. They see Jesus and Lord, they want a new life. Lord, I pray right now that they would turn from their sin and run to Jesus. To bend the knee to Christ and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins so that they may be saved and have the hope of eternal life. Lord, I pray that you would do that work right now as they hear the gospel being proclaimed. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Church, in a second, we're going to stand and we're going to sing to our King who is worthy of all honor, glory, and praise. And I just encourage you, if the Lord is working on your heart, if you have questions about the gospel, about salvation, come and find Brother Pat and I right down here after the service. We would love to talk to you. Let us stand and sing together.
Church, you can remain standing. Um, as always, I want us to close with reminding and reading our mission. So if you would, um, do we have it up? Great. So if you would just read with me each slide as we remember what God has called us to, the Great Commission, Matthew 28 says this. Join me, church. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You're dismissed. Let's go be the church.